Good morning, everyone. And welcome also to people online. There may be a few who didn't make it after yesterday's work day, <laughs> maybe viewing from home, but there's quite a crowd here, so well done. I'll start with a reading from Whispers from Eternity, which is Yogananda's book of prayer demands and poems. And this is a universal prayer in the cosmic temple. With myriad of living thoughts of devotion, I have built for thee a temple of awakened silence. I have brought the multicolored lamps of wisdom from all valid faiths. They shine with the luster of thy one truth. The commingled incense of human craving for thy love soars up in spirals from the incense bowl of our hearts. Thy sacred presence shines on altars everywhere. All prayers of all temples, tabernacles, churches, mosques, and viharas are chanting to thee in the universal language of deep love. The orchestra of our combined feelings plays in harmony with the chorus of all soul songs, with the cry of all tears, with the bursting shout of all joys, and with the united anthem of all prayers. In this wallless cosmic temple of the soul, we worship thee, our one Father. Be pleased to reveal thyself to us always. Amen, Om, Amen. I'll just say I was re-watching the dedication of our beautiful Temple of Light. And if you haven't, if you weren't there or you haven't watched it recently, it's really quite inspiring where we had um, representatives of all the different faiths that you see in the niches here. And at the end, uh, Nayaswami Devi read that poem and it's just such a beautiful reminder of that one light, that one truth that shines through all the different pathways. And it's so beautiful to get to come into this temple and feel that, to be reminded of that, to tune into that, to experience that, not just to have it as a thought, but to really be in that experience of that light, of that truth that flows through each one of us. There was an article that was circulating recently about an interreligious uh, gathering in Singapore of young people and it was attended by Pope Francis. And he was quoted as saying, all religions are paths to God. All religions are paths to God. And he compared them to different languages, just like different languages, different dialects to help us get there. But God is God for everyone. There's that one truth, that one God. And we all just have our different expression, our different way of finding that truth, of experiencing that truth, of living in that truth. And I love this idea of language because as much as we have all these different languages, even each individual person speaks their language in their own unique way, with their own accent, their own dialect, their own voice, their own unique voice. And so it is with the spiritual path. There's all these different religions, all these different expressions, and yet each individual is going to walk that path differently. Every Hindu, every Muslim, every Christian is going to express that truth, that path in their own unique way. And I'm so blessed to be here at Ananda Village and get to see how every one of us is expressing this path of self-realization in our own unique way. It's, it's so inspiring and gives me so much hope. Like, wow, if God can create a path for every one of these people, why not me? You know, we all have a chance. And that's what I was really thinking about with the different pathways. There's this expression of God's infinite compassion infinite love to give every single soul the opportunity, just the right path, just the right way to come back to him, to come home to that truth. We all have 
our unique path to walk. And it's interesting how much it can seem like the differences are such a cause for tension and turmoil and violence and disharmony in the world. And I say seem because it's not really the differences that are causing all of that. It's how we perceive those differences. It's how we respond and react to those differences. So it's not the differences themselves that are causing all these problems. It's our perception. As Atman was talking about last week, when we use our intellect, our rational mind guided by the ego, what does it do? It likes to judge and compare and evaluate and separate and divide and put everything in these little boxes, right? Like the song that we heard this morning, right? It's good or bad. It's right or wrong. It's either or. We get in this either or consciousness and we put everything and everyone in these little boxes. Now, maybe we don't do that all the time, but we all have that tendency somewhere, somehow, sometimes to get caught by that, don't we? And the problem with that is that when we put everything in little boxes, guess what? We're in a little box too. <laughs> We're limited. We're not able to express our full potential. And that's not what God wants. That's not who we really are. It's just Maya, it's delusion, right? That's trying to keep us limited, it's trying to keep us caught, trying to keep us you know, in this illusion of separation. And God is constantly trying to pull us back together, trying to bring us back and remind us of that underlying oneness, of who we really are, of that unlimited potential. Every path to God is a path to get out of the box, to get out of the boxes and to expand. So no matter what path we might find ourselves on, how do we overcome this tendency to get pulled into that consciousness of separation. Well, the first thing I'd like to explore is looking beyond outer appearances. And this weekend, we're celebrating Lahiri Mahashaya, whose life is a perfect example of this. Outwardly, he was married, he had two children, and he worked as a government accountant in India. Not exactly where I go looking for an avatar. So outwardly, there's this experience, there's this appearance, and yet inwardly, he was self-realized. He was with God. And not only that, he was quietly sharing that realization quietly sharing Kriya Yoga with everyone who came to him. Everyone. And this is the other example from Lahiri's life. He didn't get Kriya and just go off into the Himalayas. That wasn't his mission. He asked Babaji, let me share this with everyone, not just people who are able to become renunciates, but everyone. So I'd like to read a little from Autobiography of a Yogi. Yogananda said, a significant feature of Lahiri Mahashaya's life was his gift of Kriya initiation to those of every faith. Not Hindus only, but Muslims and Christians were among his foremost disciples. Monists and dualists, those of all faiths or of no established faith, were impartially received and instructed by the universal guru. And he goes on to say, those from every walk of life found shelter under the master's omnipresent wings. Like all God-inspired prophets, Lahiri Mahashaya gave new hope to the outcasts and downtrodden of society. He wasn't caught in those outward appearances, those outward differences. What was he paying attention to, that inner longing of the heart, that love of the heart, that longing for truth. And anyone who was longing for that truth, he offered those teachings at Kriya Yoga. And we see this example in the lives 
of masters and saints throughout time. And it's an invitation not just to see their greatness, but to realize they're showing us as an example of how we ought to be and how we can find that truth, that light within ourselves by letting go of judgment, letting go of comparing, letting go of this attachment that we have to looking at the outer differences and tuning into that inner experience, that inner connection, that inner oneness. That's who we really are. We see in the life of Jesus, look at the people that he chose to preach to, the people that he chose as his disciples, people that were hated, sick, the poor, the outcast. And just think the power of that love, of that compassion still moves us today, still touches us, has changed the world and continues to change the world because it wasn't his love. He was a channel for that divine love, for that divine compassion. And we all have an opportunity to be a channel for that compassion, for that love, to follow the example of the great masters. There's many examples in the life of Yogananda that Swami Kriyananda shares of his kindness, his compassion. He was many things, expressed many different facets of the divine, of power and energy and joy, but especially also that compassion and there's one story that I like especially, and it's of Swami Kriyananda's time at Mount Washington when he was a monk. And they had a dining room down in the basement. And it wasn't very clean, is <laughs> what Swami, how Swami put it. You know, it was, it was pretty messy. <laughs> and Yogananda one day came down into the dining room unexpectedly, and they hadn't cleaned up yet. And Swami Kriyananda said, interpret how you will, yet. <laughs> and, you know, Swami was thinking, oh, you know, expecting a tirade, you know, expecting reprimand. And all Master did was look around calmly and say, it could be worse. <laughs> that perfect, calm acceptance. What a beautiful example and what a beautiful invitation to all of us to bring that into our day-to-day -day life. I like to think about that story. It could be worse. You know, when I'm getting caught maybe in comparing or judging or having expectations about how something should be or how someone should be, it could be worse. Just to remember that, that compassion. What would, how would Master see this person? How would Master see this situation? With, without judgment. It's not to say that he didn't reprimand, that he didn't give feedback or guidance. Of course, of course. There's a story um, when he was scolding one of the monks. And at the end, the monk said to him pleadingly, but master, you will forgive me, won't you? And master looked at him surprised. What else could I do? Of course, no judgment. He was only scolding to try and help the disciple, to try and guide the disciple. There was no sense of judgment, no sense of criticism. And so trying to bring that gentleness, that sweetness, that patience into our daily lives. And one of the best ways I know to do that is to practice appreciation. And <coughs> I was thinking about appreciation and I actually thought, well, let me look up what does the word appreciate mean? And I was stunned by what I found as a definition. To recognize the full worth of. To appreciate something is to recognize the full worth of. Something about that just struck me because that's what the guru is doing for us. That's what God does for us. He appreciates us. He sees our goodness. He sees our true potential. He sees who we really are. He sees our true worth. 
the whole package, not just the outer appearance, not who we've been or what we've done or our attitude or any of those things. He recognizes our full worth. And that's what God is calling each one of us to do, to recognize the full worth of other beings, of everyone we meet, to see that goodness, to look for that goodness, to appreciate the differences. There's an incredible story from the life of Frank Laubach. I mean, his whole life is kind of incredible. He was a Christian missionary in the Philippines in the 1930s. And he was there to, he went there trying to reach the Muslim people there. And he really struggled when he first got there. And he was feeling very alone, very discouraged and struggling spiritually. And so he started this practice of trying to think of God at least once every minute, every minute throughout the day. And there's a wonderful collection of his letters where he talks about this experience, this experiment. And so, you know, thinking of God, talking to God throughout the day, and he would go up every evening onto this hill and pray and talk to God and try to hear his response. And one night when he was feeling very discouraged, he suddenly started to feel and to hear this response kind of bubbling up from within him and speaking through his voice and saying to him, the reason you're failing, the reason you failed is because you do not truly love these people. You feel better than them. You feel superior to them. Forget that you're an American. Forget that you're a Christian and think only of how you can love them and then they will respond. Think only of how you can love them. And the voice, you know, went on to say, if you want them to be open to your religion, you have to be open to theirs. Go and study the Quran with them. So he went to the priest and he said he wanted to study the Quran and they were thrilled. They thought he was going to convert to Islam. (laughs) So they gave him a whole list of the four sacred books of Islam, the Torah, the laws of Moses. The second one was a book that contains the Psalms of David. The third one was a book that contains the gospels of Jesus. And the fourth one is the Quran of Muhammad. And so he's trying to explain in their language, you know, what little he could piece together. You know, I've spent my whole life from childhood studying the first three of these books. And the priests are trying to tell him, talk to him in a little bit in English, a little bit in their language. You know, Jesus is the holiest of prophets after Muhammad. And so there's this, this bridge that was created, this connection. And from that, he could begin to work with them and help them with the problem of illiteracy, which was, which was a big problem on the island, and begin to create a dictionary of their language. And from that, There's much more to the story, but from that, develop a program that eventually helped millions of people learn to read and write. And, you know, the the priests and the young people that worked with him were so grateful. They said, you are the first person who ever tried to appreciate us. How powerful that appreciation can be, that openness, that willingness to reach out, to respect, to be interested in someone else's experience, someone else's path, their expression. Because every faith, every path, every person has something to offer. And we just have to look for that light, look for that goodness. And I was thinking about, you know, looking for the light, that appreciation is such a core principle in education for life, which is Swami Kriyananda's approach to education based on Yogananda's teachings. And I worked with parents for a time and often they would come to me because they were experiencing lots of challenges and problems in their family with their children. And it's easy to get caught in problem consciousness no matter what our path is. And what was interesting is I would always try to start the conversation or whatever class gathering 
by asking each parent to think of something and share something that they appreciate about their child, something unique about them, something that brings them joy that they notice in their child. And no matter how many problems or how many challenges they are facing, just taking that moment to appreciate, it just completely transform the energy. It opened the heart. It took away that problem consciousness. Suddenly now, okay, we can work towards solutions. This is a good child. This is a good person in front of me. I shared once before about uh, Father Greg Boyle, who's a Catholic priest in Los Angeles who works with um, gang members and former gang members. And I was watching this interview of him once and he said, I've worked with gang members for 40 years and I've never met a bad person. I've never met an evil person. He said, you'd think in the line of work that I find myself in that I might have. He said, I've found people that are despondent, people that are traumatized, people that are wounded, people that are experiencing mental illness, but I've never met a bad person. And he lives by this belief that everyone is unshakably good. Everyone, no exceptions. And that's, that's what God's belief is. That's, that's God. Everyone is unshakably good. We have to look for that light. It's there. And as we look for that light, as we learn to look beyond the outer appearances, we learn to develop that compassion, practice appreciation, we become channels. Just like the masters, just like the saints, we become channels for that light, for that love. The choir is going to get up in a little bit and sing the song Channels, which is a beautiful, joyful song of appreciation and of celebration of that one light that flows, that shines uniquely through every aspect of nature, but also through every one of us. And the more that we can appreciate that one light that's shining in everyone, in everything, the more we put ourselves in tune with that truth, with that light. So let's all go forth in that light this week. A sailor from England, we march to a foe. The reason we win is we pray ere we go. But we pray as well, and just look at our dead. Oh, but we pray in English. The Englishman said. And ships and a birch canoe and school books and foreign trips and college proms. Good times and friends are plenty, yes, and also you. But somehow in this box would only fit one school, one family, one country, and one social rule, and certainly one church rule. Anyone with other ways is just a fool. Well, so I used to think, but now I must confess. 
that judging fools I wasn't any great success. True, some have lived without me, though I called it mine. What box could hold the world? It's just preposterous. Oh! 